Elizabeth Sackler, and it is, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be welcoming you to the first of the autumn series of States of Denial, the Illegal Incarceration of Women, Children, and People of Color. We began States of Denial in 2014 when um, people were in denial about the horrendous toll wrought by mass incarceration, except for those lives and those communities who were devastated by it. Uh, three books that year came uh, forward. Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, uh, which is a primer, really, on the racist continuum in this country, and Piper Kerman's book, Orange um, is the New Black, and then, of course, the Netflix series, which brought awareness to uh, television audiences across the country. Uh, Brian Stevenson, who started the Equal Justice Initiative, um, he wrote a riveting narrative in Just Mercy and brought us to the lives of the wrongly incarcerated who have spent decades uh, on death row and his work to get them out. Uh, all of them are still fighting uh, to eradicate the overt and accepted, the now accepted injustices of state-sanctioned violence, the murder of citizens in the streets, prisons privatized and federal as concentration camps, military war tools by local and state police against our people, and as we all know, we now have a backed military budget of $800 billion. So we are not in a better place than we started States of Denial four years ago, um, because all is front and center, and the immoral is now legal. I want to thank the Novo Foundation. The Novo Foundation over the past three years has sponsored States of Denial, and their support and outreach outreach has been extraordinary for us. And Pamela Schiffman and Jacinia Gis Santana, I don't know if you're here today, you're often here on many of the state's programs, and I want to thank you. I'd like to tell you why this is the last of our series. series. This summer, Novo announced their initiative to confront a national fascist regime that we face. This is the final support we'll have, but they are going nuclear. They are going to the heart with something called their initiative, Radical Hope. And I'm going to read you from their press release because I think it's important. I think we all should know about it and we all need to do our part um, towards it. In the United States, they write, we are experiencing a continued breakdown of the fundamental pillars of democracy, including independently functioning branches of government, rule of law, and a free press. There is an escalating assault on human rights, and the impact reverberates globally with the deepest impact on girls and women, communities facing racial and ethnic discrimination, LGBTQ people, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, immigrants and refugees, and other marginalized peoples and communities around the world, in the face of extreme greed and violence and inequality, we are experiencing barriers and divisions that threaten the strength of our movements and achievement of our deeply held visions. We must develop strategies to overcome the structural failures that are undermining our communities, including racism, misogyny, xenophobia, transphobia, and other forms of structurally reinforced hate, bigotry, and exclusion. So I'd like to ask you to give a round of applause to Novo for recognizing this. It's hard to start a beautiful day on heavy notes, but we are living in heavy times. And so the fact that we have beautiful days, I think, should give us hope the feeling of life, of flowers, of new birth. Thank you, Novo, and best of luck for your new initiatives. Here at the Brooklyn Museum, we've been celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, 
and I conceived the Sackler Center uh, actually in 2001, and it has been all of these 10 years committed to equality, equity, and justice. And it was almost 11 years ago, actually, that I toured Gloria Steinem through the Sackler Center before the press opening, uh, the, before the press conference. And um, we're the first institutional center for feminist anything. And Gloria looked up at that sign and she said, we're in, we're in. And I think Gloria was in years before, but yes, institutionally we're in, and I think we all know what this has meant uh, for our city and hopefully, of course, for our country. For a decade, Gloria has given me and the center and the museum her time, her energy, her support to all aspects of the Sackler Center, and I thank you, Gloria, deeply uh, for the light that you shine. You provide introductions that enhance our programming and with those whom you have joined in panel and in discussion and with your presence. So please join me in thanking Gloria Steinem for everything. Thank you, Gloria. Today you've given us another contribution. Prison baby, Deborah Triang, Stein and Gloria Steinem in conversation. Je Deborah Jiang Stein is the author of Prison Baby, a memoir of the discovery of her birth mother. Deborah lived her first year with her mother inside a prison and like many, entered foster care thereafter. Later adopted, Deborah grew up in Seattle. Deborah is evidence that no matter how the odds are stacked, personal transformation is possible. Her spirit is imprinted with purpose in the magnificence, resilience of the human spirit. She is on a mission to inspire incarcerated women and girls in communities with hope and tools for success outside prison and to raise public awareness about the social, emotional, and life needs for incarcerated women and for the children who are left behind. Deborah is the founder and executive director of the Unprison Project, offering programs and curriculum focused on cultural identity, child welfare, transracial adoption, juvenile justice, youth healing, and more. So I thank you, Gloria, and I thank you, Deborah, for being here today. I'd like to offer some statistics as a way to focus our attention and put um, a context around this discussion. The sentencing, sentencing Project reports 12 years ago that 63% of the people in federal prisons were parents of minor children. Most incarcerated people at that time were far fathers. 750,000 fathers, 65,000 mothers. In 25 years, the number of incarcerated fathers increased by 76%, and the number of incarcerated mothers increased by 122%. As a result, the number of children with parents in prison increased from 63% to 80%. We must continue to question America's penal system, its intentional destruction of families and communities and the traumatic effect on our children that has been shown to begin a cycle of violence. It is unacceptable to discard human lives. It is inhuman to treat children, any child, as indispensable. This overt abuse and torture must be stopped. Deborah has given us a prelude today for which I'm very grateful, and I quote, for more than 10 years, Deborah has collected interviews with women in prisons. She is now transforming this collection into monologues for staged performance. Today, we will open with a 10-minute excerpt performed by Abigail Ramsey and directed by Tasha Gordon-Solomon. We hope you will hear the hope in the women's voices and hear their dreams and struggles so that we can pay more attention to the humanity of women in prisons and the need 
to dismantle mass incarceration. Abigail Ramsey's first role post-drama school was as an overworked social worker in a London shelter navigating an influx of post-war Balkan refugees. Since then, she has committed to co engage audiences with innovative, adventurous, and socially relevant work. Please join me in welcoming Abigail Ramsey. Thank you. more than prison. You just don't care because the worst thing they could have done was separate me from my kids. Let's see. I came in when I was 15 years old. A prostitution thing and other situations. People don't really like to say what they're in for. I started to get into a lot of trouble when I was 13. There was this guy and I really liked him. He was 19. He was cute, and I don't know, kind of went on from there. He never paid me. I paid him, and then we had a kid together. But when our daughter was four, we broke up. After that, I started going out with an Italian guy and had three kids by him. My worst pain came from my second to oldest, my son who just had a birthday when I came in. Giving him up to foster care was one of the hardest things in my life to do. In order for me to let go, they had to come and take him while, I, while he was asleep. It, looked, it hurt to look at him so innocent and small. I could just imagine the look on his face when he woke up and mommy wasn't there. Day after day, night after night, and it got worse, missing his twos and threes. Those are special days when they become their own person. And I'll never, ever get those back. I have a lot of dreams for my kids. I want them all to go to school. I don't want them to drop out. So far, my daughter loves school. When it's time for her to go in the morning, because she'll be in the first grade this year, she can't wait. So she wants to go and get up and go, go, go. <laughs> and oh gosh, my, my other daughter, oh. I got a daughter who really is a brain. She really is. When I get out, I won't do nothing different. I mean, I go back to my home and work. Just go back to my kids. Well, I guess they'll be on their own by then. But still, my kids. Audrey, aged 42, from Washington State. Sometimes it's a task to get to the day without someone hollering at you or you hollering at them for doing something stupid. In my unit, we're crazy people. People just wild and obnoxious. And there are quite a few people, for some reason, who are intimidated by me. <laughs> and that's just because when I get angry at someone, I'm not afraid to tell them. Sometimes it comes out in a way that's not so polite. I first got arrested when I was 12. Arrested for selling LSD in school. I didn't take it at the time. I was more into drinking. I was 11 when I first had my first drink. I'd party with my friends and meet all kinds of people and laugh and do stupid things just for the hell of it. Pretty soon, everything built up and by the time I turned 18, I was in and out of juvenile detox 14 times. 
This is my fourth time that I've been in either prison or jail. One time, a week after I got out, they came to my residence and served me with a warrant for something that I'd done two months before I'd gotten in. I caught another 17-month sentence. I spent eight and a half months in the hole that time. Eight and one half. You know, when you're locked up in that little room, things get to you. There's just a bed, a steel toilet, and a desktop. You get an hour out for a cigarette or maybe wreck. Half the time, I didn't even get out. And when I did, I was in handcuffs and shackles. They showered me in shackles three times a week. Yeah, handcuffs and shackles in the shower. I'm Native American. I grew up with white people in foster homes, and I asked them, how come my skin was darker and my hair was darker than my foster brothers and sisters? I never got an answer. They would just change the subject. I have seven sisters and four brothers, same mother. Everyone went to foster homes originally, and she took everyone back but me. I met my mom when I was 15. It was in court. They were trying to take away her rights because at this whole time, she had parental rights, which I didn't know because she didn't even try to see me. She was drunk, loud, obnoxious. Look at my baby, look at my baby. Oh, isn't she cute? My social worker came by and said, well, go give her a hug or do something, say something to her. And I said, if she stops talking so loud like that, maybe I will. Right now, I don't want to go up and associate myself with her. Finally, I walked up with my social worker who said, this is your mom, this is your daughter. And she's like, give me a hug. And I smelled the booze and piss and, and puke, everything. And I stepped back and I just, I shook her hand and she kept insisting on a hug. And I was so angry. And my mom says, well, I care for her. She's my daughter. And then I said, well, where the fuck were you all this time? I'm 15 years old. Catherine, age 33, from Maryland. When I woke up this morning, I was, oh, you're getting out tomorrow. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, see whoever you want. This is the final chapter to a mistake I made. I want it done. I want it over with. I want to walk out of here and breathe freely. Sometimes the pressure gets tremendous. I've been doing a lot of soul searching, looking at myself as a person, my values, my situation, how I articulate. I'm 33. It's like, come on, you're this old and not really know yourself? I think of my kids. I have one daughter. She's 12 years old. And then there's my son, just turned eight. And I have twins, three years old. I have a family, mother, father, four brothers. My father was a hardworking black man. I remember him struggling so much to feed us and to keep a roof over our head. He used to work at the car wash for $2 a day. I admire how my parents pulled together and my mother kept my family's sanity together. It's a little scary right now because I have no idea where I'll go after I'm out. I'm seriously thinking about going to social work or some kind of criminal justice or whatever so I could help women in prison because they need somebody who's dealt with this from the inside perspective. But I don't have skills. You've been in prison for years and you come back and so much has changed. How the hell are you supposed to find a job? I just figure, shit, life's short. 
and I want to do something for myself. I did a poetry reading at the talent show last night. <laughs> Everybody stood up and clapped. <laughs> and I mean, I couldn't believe it <laughs> because I didn't expect that kind of reaction. I pulled the podium close to the audience and I just told it like it was. Really surprised me. Yeah. Everybody stood up and clapped. And it made me feel like, all right, I can do it. Please join me in welcoming Gloria Steinem and Deborah Chiang Stein. Thank you, Abigail. It was great to hear that for the first time. Before I start, I want to thank Dr. Sackler for including me in the series. We, uh, I've read about this, and it's, it's an honor to be here. And I know I'm sitting in this chair because of our meeting a few years ago. So something in uh, Gloria's bio, which is magnificent, isn't ever mentioned because the only people that know about it are a few hundred women in a prison and a few thousand men in a, another prison. We walked through both of those prisons, and I was told later that they are saving the chair that you sat in, set aside. So the first, when I, I was struck when I heard that, well, and then I thought, well, what about my chair? But that's not. <laughs> and I recognize it's uh, in our walking through that prison, it was that, that we were witnessing and they were being witnessed and seen, which is what I find most win women want to know about. So I'm interested in uh, hearing your experience doing those two things with me. And you, even in the men's prison, we got a quote from a man that said, I'm 27, African-American, and you spoke to me. This was during Domestic Abuse Month. You spoke to me about how I can be a better man. So it really crossed some boundaries. So I'm interested in hearing about that experience. I think we all have a feeling that a prison is a separate place, right? Distant. And the minute you go inside and you are suddenly yourself deprived of your own freedom, you know, you have to give up your purse and you have to have identification and you have to, you know, you have, all, you know, so you, be, you just barely begin, I think, to feel a hint at what it's like to be deprived of all personal possessions and freedom and so on. And then you begin to meet people uh, and sit down and talk. And you discover that though they are in a whole different atmosphere, uh, it's like us here in this room, right? I mean, the circumstances are, some are different, partly because our public schools uh, are such a shame, you know, and there really is the school to prison pipeline that we know about. Uh, and it's about poverty, it's about, uh, especially in the case of women, women who end up taking the rap for their boyfriends or husbands crimes because they're sometimes more afraid of their husbands and boyfriends and being, telling the truth about, you know, what was going on than they are of the prison. I mean, you know, they're, but it's the circumstances that are different, not the human beings. And that is my overwhelming feeling forevermore. So now, thanks to Deborah, wherever I go, I try, I try to say, oh, you know, what's the nearest prison to you? Uh, I mean, Bedford Hills Women's Prison, is, we know, 
right? But there are many other, and you know, a lot of our prisons are full of people who are not convicted, but only accused. We only have to, you know, read the news to, to know that. And it's just, uh, it's just um, possible, I think, for each of us to do something, to take books to the prison, to, uh, if we can't go ourselves, you know, some, something, something. I mean, we each, and we can talk about it later when, when we are in our discussion time, you know, what we can each do. But anyway, that was the gift. That was the gift. I'm glad you brought that up about what people can do, because I, I watch, uh, you know, I watch TED Talks. There are platforms like this, which I'm grateful for, Aspen Ideas, and sometimes that's for a certain demographic of people, which is really kind of interesting, which is to bring awareness but a lot of people say, well, we want to go out and do something. And you're right, not everyone can get into a prison. And I'm curious, I don't really know what to say other than do something and start talking about it. Teach literacy in grade schools because that's where, it's, that's where it starts. But related to women, there's something very strong that I'm aware of that economic security is at the foundation or economic insecurity of every woman that I meet in a prison, which is also out here. I, uh, most women I know have this fear of being a bag lady at some time or another out here. So imagine the women that we meet on the inside. And I don't know how to change that tide. It's not only about wage equality, but I think about that it intersects with poverty and racism. So I'm wanting to talk about that, how we build in yeah. and battle economic insecurity because that starts the path. It, it partly dep it depends where we are. It happens that we live in New York State, which has a law against running prisons for profit. I think we can all be proud of our state be because of that. Not that our prisons are, you know, we need to worry about it, <laughs> but, but at least they're not run for profit. And in, in the last, uh, you know, 25 years or so, there's been a huge increase in the number of prisons that are run by Wackenhut or some, you know, corporate, you cannot run a prison for profit, I'm sorry. And public schools now are having this, you know, are they gonna be sources of profit too? So in, in some states where we are, uh, or where we may have family, or where we came from, it may be discovering that the state legislature is the problem, because they are taking the money that should go to public education and especially state universities, I mean, part of the reason that students are now graduating in debt, which didn't happen in my generation, huge amounts of debt. Are there students in debt in this audience? Raise your hands. My daughter should raise her hand. Uh, <laughs> that's so wrong. I can't begin to tell you. And it can't be bankrupted. It can't, I mean, you know, we're trying to do it. Okay. So, <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, it's the only country in the world in which this is happening. And part of the reason is because business corporate interests state by state have taken, have persuaded state legislators to take money out of public education and use it to build prisons we don't need and to run them for a profit. I mean, that's a, an oversimplification, but it's what happens. So we... And this is partly because we have paid more attention or, to Washington than we have to our state legislators. And, you know, we, we need to rectify that. So, you know, that is, that is, you know, very much part of the system because as long as a prisoner is a source of profit to corporations, there are going to be more prisoners. Right now in New York State, it costs more to keep uh, a man, probably a woman too, I don't know, the statistic is a man, in prison than it does to send somebody to Harvard. Hello? I mean, you know, this is insane, right? <laughs> right. Um, and then also more recently I got educated because thanks again to the Great Novo Foundation, we are able to uh, take the women's prison that in Manhattan, you know, the, the Bayview Women's Prison that's at 26th and 11th, that was um, flooded in Hurricane Sandy and therefore was, you know, no longer a prison, uh, to take it and turn it into a women's building. It's the great symbolism 
you know, of, of being able to, to do this. The, and the, we tried to find all the women we could who had ever been incarcerated there, and they are helping to, in this transformation. So that has been a process of meeting and learning and you know, listening to their stories. And, and the th thing I love the most is that, that when, the, uh, when it begins to, to have, to, what's, what's the word, demolition, when the demolition begins, some of the previously incarcerated That's women amazing. are going to be there with sledgehammers. <laughs> to, <laughs> Tear down those walls. That's right, amazing. Right, right, right. <laughs> But, um, but that's been an education for me, you know, to, to be there, to be present, and to, uh, to just listen and, and, and get to know each other. There's nothing replaces listening to each other's stories, in or out of prison. <laughs> right. I'm interested in seeing Bayview, actually. It's, it's kind of a model, because there are other prisons. It's an interesting cycle. A prison will be uh, depopulated in some ways and then it'll e either be privatized for profit, but this model of turning it into a community center. And someone asked me earlier, I'd be interested in talking about this, because really, it, unless the most violent are sent there, where, what happens to women who have need to be sentenced? And my thought was, well, wh why not in the community where we live and work with our families? And we are the nurturers, typically, mm -hmm. so always separated from the families. And there's a community uh, unrest about that, that we don't want women like that by us. And I'm wondering what you think about actually building centers for recovery and treatment in our neighborhoods mm -hmm. for sentencing, which could be controversial yeah, in some places. Yeah, there are, there are three main women's prisons in New York State. One Bedford. is closer to the border than this one in Bayview. You know, this, this one is now closed. And I, I, I learned once this was becoming a women's building that Bayview had the worst uh, record for the sexual abuse of women prisoners by guards of any of uh, the three prisons, which I couldn't figure out until the women explained to me, <laughs> who had been there, that because it was the most desired prison, because it was closer to their families and because oh, right they could perhaps see their kids or have a part-time release job, that all of those possibilities required sexual favors in order to get them from the guards, right? I mean, that's how bad it is. So, um, you, you know, the, you, just, you just need to listen to stories and ask questions and, and figure out how, but, I, I, I just want to say we can also learn from, from other older cultures that it doesn't have to be like this. For instance, um, I was, I've been trying for years, and I hope eventually, <laughs> to do a book that was inspired, and I was doing with Wilma Mankiller, who was one of the people who got an award here, thanks to Liz, uh, the chief of the Cherokee Nation. We were trying to take features of uh, original cultures that we could learn from and just write about them briefly. All right. One of them was from one of the oldest cultures in Ghana where people who do an antisocial destructive thing are indeed punished with isolation. Since we are communal animals, maybe isolation is a universal punishment, but for a short time, not like sol solitary confinement that we do, <laughs> but a short period of, of isolation. Then when that person is brought back into the society, there's a long period of time, a long ritual period of time, in which everyone who knows that person tells that person every good thing they ever did. We could do that. It's amazing. We do the reverse. Right. You know, we, we continue we to punish people. Right. We take away their vote. We take away their ability to get a job. Uh, you know, it's all we can do now just not to put your prison record on your job application. You know, we've finally begun to do that. Uh, so it, it isn't as if we don't have models of what to do. We do. 
And I, I've heard you tell that story before in a prison with me. I should let you know that after you told it, I went back and said, because there's no cost to that solution. No. I started thinking, so I went back to the transitional staff there and I said, what about starting a pilot and doing that? And they agreed oh, that's to so it. that's so great. I is that not great? I forgot to tell This you is that. the reward. You say something and it actually right. does. This is fantastic. This is a, right. They, and I said, so it's an interesting model because what if they have no one in the community to surround them? And I said, what about part of reentry? You start introducing community people a year before they are released, so they build a relationship. So then on the day of release, they can be surrounded by the community that only met them for the purpose of doing this. So you, that story was pretty amazing. And no cost to the government. In fact, we don't need the government for that. <laughs> so, in fact, stay away from it, is what I thought. <laughs> well, we're going to tell Trump every bad thing he ever did as right. soon as he <laughs> I was wondering if we were going to hear about that. You mentioned some statistics, which, which I was glad to hear. There are a couple I have related to women, uh, which are, can open up a huge conversation. One of them is that the spike in incarceration for women has, is 800% over the last few decades, twice that of men, which is 400%. Mm -hmm. And I'm often asked why, and I don't, the courts don't really know why other than there are, there are more drug-related, alcohol-related crimes, and more underneath all of that, more domestic abuse, and underneath all that, trauma. And so really our prisons are trauma centers, is how I'm starting to see it. And the solution, I think, is that people know that out here, because of when I tell people those numbers, or that we have 300, 3 million kids with, with a parent in prison, they're surprised. And so the, there's less focus on women, and I'm glad that there is this. But I'm wondering if you think this has become a trend. And I, I'm not snarky about it, but I've seen, I've been around enough, not as long as you, to see trends in social interest. And my concern is that incarceration, especially with women, will be a cycle and a trend until the next social justice issue. And I'm interested in, other than keep talking about it, what are the things that we can do as a public to keep something not a trend? You know, it used to be about women and then it wasn't about women. You know, I think there are different causes for this trend. One is that the prison profiteering has increased a lot since the second Bush, who presided over the uh, privatizing of more prisons than anybody else by far. And once there's profit in prisoners, you get a, a different uh, motivation, right? Then also change in the drug laws, because you know women have often been uh, present when drug transactions were taking place, but not necessarily in the past guilty. And also. Um, they, they, they literally may be more afraid to testify against their husbands or boyfriends mm -hmm. or dealers than they are to go to prison. Uh, so, you know, I think those are, are some, some of the reasons, two of the, two of the big reasons, because it isn't, as far as I can tell, it isn't that women ourselves are behaving differently, can you? I mean... I, I think other... No, I actually, maybe drug and alcohol abuse, but that's because of trauma. Yeah, so, but we're um, not robbing banks, you know. We're right, <laughs> right, right. One thought I had, and I don't know if it's true, is that most judges are men, and 20 years ago, it was hard for them to sentence their, what felt like their mothers and grandmothers and sisters, and so in some ways, equalizing women became truly equal in sentencing, but I don't know. I've even had courts not really. I don't, I don't know. The best sentencing, sentencing story I've heard so far is that there, there was a woman in Florida who was one of the few women judges, and uh, she always had a little dog with her behind the, you know, bench, and she was, you know, very glamorous and so on, and a great smart judge. And when she uh, was sentencing a man who had <clears throat> been convicted of sexual assault multiple times and finally killed someone, killed a woman. She got up from behind the bench and picked up her robe and said, 
You see these legs? These are women's legs. These are the last women's legs <laughs> we'll ever see. <laughs> That's good, right? <laughs> Sorry, that was just a digression. But <laughs> It's sort of stuck one. in my mind because it was so rare. <laughs> well, it reminds me, um, thank you for putting me in your recent memoir, by the way, but you dedicated that to a doctor, which is, it, it feels similar to me in that it's calling attention to what's normally not seen and, and who serves us. I want to talk about exoneration. Well, we had a conversation about it. I did some research on it because DNA has played an influence in exonerating men mm -hmm. and uh, academic institutions and uh, liberal lawyers are really getting involved in that for men. And I learned that women are never exonerated because our DNA is everywhere in a scene of crime because it's in the, by the dishwasher and the closet and in the kitchen sink. And so when a crime lab comes in, it's no, there's no way to say, She's only been here once because she's been in there a lot. And I realize that even the, the most advanced systems we have for freedom aren't serving women. And it's gender justice, again, in a different way. And I've wanted to know uh, who and does it take petitioning a university to do some kind of different kind of research because in some ways a conversation like this and awareness can steer away from that and say find something that serves women. Not yeah, just men. No, I didn't know that until Deborah was just, you were just telling me that today. I didn't know that. And it's so ironic that because we're the housekeepers, our DNA is everywhere. And yet in most states, there are thousands of rape kits of DNA that's inside <laughs> women from sexual right. assault. And the rape kits aren't being analyzed. You know, uh, there's, they're stockpiled. There's... You know, I mean, uh, it's, it's some, somewhat better uh, in, in New York City, but it's still a problem in most states, I would say. Uh, and there's, there's one more reason that I forgot to say as to why there are more uh, women being imprisoned, and I think one other element, which is that when women, are, women kill or injure someone in self-defense, there's very often not a self-defense plea that they can legally make uh, because it's, it's, you know, they've been living with this guy for a period of time and self-defense is usually perceived as hot pursuit, you know, in the moment like that and the laws are written like that. Um, now, you know, some, I mean, the governor of Ohio, for instance, pardoned every single woman who was in prison for murder when she shouldn't have been because she actually killed in self-defense after years of torture and so on. But that's rare. We still have the problem embedded in the law of women unable to use a self-defense plea when they were indeed defending themselves or their, and or their children. I, I didn't know that actually. I want to talk about, uh, it's a little bit of a deviation, but it relates to prison because some of what we're doing is, is teaching a new kind of awareness, just a new thinking pattern. You've talked about, people talk about learning. I've heard you say you are unlearning. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I noticed that about you, that you sort of look at the reverse side of things, which really teaches me some things. And I recognize that I'm unlearning a story that I had about the stigma of mothers in prison and, ch and uh, offspring of incarcerated women. And so I'm interested in knowing uh, what you are unlearning these days. Well, I think we're all in different stages of unlearning gender. You know, I mean, gender is relatively new in human history. Old languages like Cherokee and, I mean, you know, hundreds of old languages. Uh, on every continent, uh, didn't have he and she, didn't have gendered pronouns, people were people. So gender comes from what seems to be the first step in most, and as far as I know, pretty much all hierarchies, which is controlling women's bodies as the means of reproduction. If women didn't have wombs, we'd be fine, you know? <laughs> and, 
uh, you know, as little as 600 years ago, uh, where we are now, where they were in Native American territory, women controlled their own, decided when and whether to have children, and the, it was, there were cultures that were, the paradigm of which was a circle, not a pyramid. And, and that was true, you know, you can still see it in, in the Quay and the San in Africa, in the tip of India, the southern, the Kerala, the matrilineal cultures there, some matrilineal cultures in central China. I mean, you know, you can, you, you can still see it. Um, so uh, I think some things that we want once we're here, and one is a, is a society without these polarized gender roles, and also, we invented race. You know, there, there's a, a, quite a good documentary called The Journey of Man, which I commend to you, which is, follows the DNA trails of humans from Southern Africa around the coasts and so on. And, and you know, you can see that race is a minor adaptation to climate. But the individual difference, that each of us is unique, uh, is, and our human sameness is the, the way bigger. So the differences between two members of the same quote unquote race or gender are actually bigger than the differences between groups, you know? So, you know, we're, and, and I, when I say that, I do not mean for a moment to, to minimize how deep race and gender go because the good news about being human is that we can adapt and so our species survives. But the bad news is we can adapt. So we adapt to anything. Right? And, and again, our Indian country <laughs> folks say it takes four generations to cure, to heal one act of violence. So, you know, these, these, even though they are inventions, they are deep and I don't mean to say they aren't deep, but it does help, don't you think, to know that they were invented, they're not human nature, and most of human history didn't have them, didn't have race and gender. So I, that's what I mean by unlearning. Right, that's interesting about uh, gender. I was, my daughter graduated from NYU and Pharrell Williams spoke and he said, you're the first generation, this is a graduation for the women, he addressed, and he said, you are the first generation of young women that are on an equal platform with your males. And I thought, interesting. And I, don't, and I don't know if he thought that or they thought that, but what do you think? Is there sudden, a sudden shift I didn't know about? Because, <laughs> gosh, did I? Well, you know, because but, I've seen- But my, let me just say the guys are not graduating with a spinster of arts degree or getting a mistress of science. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize that that's kind of a you know a, a elite area, but it's I the stories I hear are the same I, I heard for you know in the 70s, mm -hmm. and you probably heard in the 60s and 50s. So I don't know if there's that much of a shift, but I'm uh, curious. There's not a lot of talk about gender and racism, the intersection of that in prisons, and so one of the things that that I like that we did together was bringing in awareness about that because it, it just caused, even though we didn't talk about it, it caused people to think and, and talk about it. So I wanna go back to the addiction to incarceration. I read a number, which I had to research, that our country spends 80 billion a year on incarceration, and which is a huge number, and most of those people are going back, so it is a lot more than, than higher education. And, and who's profiting from that in exactly. most cases? Right. Well, you've brought that up a few times. Are you, are you of the mind that uh, profit, for-profit prisons, private ones should close it, it, and it, be closed? It plays a big role, absolutely. Right. Bed filling, right? It's a little bit like hospitals in some way. They, they lose money if the, if the beds are empty. So if it's not for profit and it's not a, a social, because prisons are not a social justice enterprise as well, then what do you think we do with, with wanting to have 
someone removed from society if we do for certain acts. Well, you know, it is true that a destruct some people are destructive enough in every culture, you know, to to need to be separated so they can't do any more destruction. But the idea of their being there is, if at, a, at, at all possible, is to help them uh, change. I mean, and from what we know, uh, it's very often that if they're violent in adulthood, they may have been treated with violence as children. It's not always true, I'm not saying. I mean, there are some people who just cannot empathize with other human beings. I'm not trying to say it's all the time true. But, you know, to, to try to uh, help this miracle of a human being to become somebody who can live in the world and understand what I think, I swear to you, I think little kids mostly understand from birth, <laughs> just, we just know, that we're not more important than anybody else, but we're not less important either. And that's why I'm always repeating what the little kids say to me, which is, you are not the boss of me. Right. <laughs> and it's not fair. Right. Okay, these are the, two, right? Do they not say this? Okay, I rest my case, all right. And then you told, you said, and they've never forgotten, because I've been back to that prison, if it walks like a duck, and what, can you say that? No, what that no I, I, I think that uh, sometimes we're, um, I'm sure it happens to men too, but I think women, is, you know, we're in a situation where we kind of know what's going on and we That's know right. that somebody's Intuition. putting us down or we're in danger or it's not what it's presented to be or, you, you know, whatever. But we say, no, no, I have to be polite and it's, you know, and it's not rational and it must be okay and everything. So there's, somebody said this to me, I didn't make it up, you know. If it, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and looks like a duck and you think it's a pig, it's a pig. <laughs> Trust your instinct, <laughs> right? They remember that, which is interesting, because all, all along they've been not trusting their instincts mm -hmm. and thinking that landed in prison. So that, to me, the message was trust your instinct. Yeah, it's and it's part of it's part of uh, of being treated by society as invisible or wrong. Uh, it means you don't trust your instinct, which is. Way, I mean, our mental processes are great, but our all five senses, sensory, everything together, understanding of what's, you know, you, you sense an earthquake coming, not intellectually, but, you know, right? So you, that's true in life, too, so to trust that. Um, so I'm weaving around between uh, women's issues and incarceration. Is there, are there one or two things that you thought would be gone in, in our status as women that are still persisting, or even worse? Mm -hmm. Probably worse, but I'm wondering what you thought. <laughs> well, I don't mean generally, but there are things that, that might be, but what you thought No, no, you for forget sure how old I am, okay? Is that one of the virtues of being really old, which I am, is that you remember when it was really worse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, well, it is, it is a, better. You're it is on a better. mission for specific things to change, which we all benefit for. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. But there must have been things you thought I uh, worked towards this and on this, and it will certainly mm -hmm. something will change. Well, the, yeah, there are some big things. I mean, uh, I, one big thing is that I don't get why people don't understand that you can't have racism without sexism, and vice versa. You know that these things are, are intertwined because. Of course, in a one-race culture, you can still have a patriarchy that discriminates against women, but if you have a racist or, or caste, as in India, or class, or whatever it is, it makes it way worse because you, in order to maintain the separation of these groups, uh, you have to control women's bodies as the means of reproduction. So it affects women differently. That is, classically, say, in the history of this country, white women were sexually restricted in order to keep the white race pure, and black women were sexually exploited in order to produce cheap labor, but all women are in trouble as long as there's racism. All women, so there's no such thing as fighting 
sexism without also racism. I mean, these things are just too intertwined. And it does totally drive me crazy <laughs> that we all, I don't, you know, that people keep treating, it, it drives me crazy. <laughs> right, right. Um, and also the other thing that drives me crazy is that w women, the issues of women of all races and the issues of race are treated as if they were separate from all of society when, in fact, you know, if people talk about economic stimulus, okay, nobody talks about just equal pay for women of all races, which would be the biggest economic stimulus this nation could ever have, because we're going to spend the money. We're not going to, you know, t go put it in bank accounts in Switzerland, no. <laughs> <We're> gonna, right, right. <laughs> I mean, but, but, but when economists talk about ec economic stimulus, they don't talk about equal pay for, for all women, right? Uh, and th the other part, in addition to the economic part of it, that drives me crazy, the, the, the violence against females is treated as if it was separate f from other violence when in fact the, the, the biggest determinant, and I, I keep quoting a book called Sex and World Peace, which I think I have done on this stage before, but do get it if you do, it's a great book, which demonstrates that in every country in the world, the biggest determinant of whether the country is violent inside itself or will be willing to use military violence against another country is actually not poverty, access to natural resources, uh, degree of democracy, or religion, it's violence against females. Not because women's lives are any more important than men's lives, but because that's what we see first, because patriarchy that is controlling women in order to control reproduction is the first step in every hierarchy I know of. Maybe there's some exception somewhere. And, and when we see that, whether it's dominance or actual violence, it tells us, you know, because we are malleable, it, it tells us that it's okay for one group to dominate another by birth. It's even natural. It's inevitable. So if, you, if you're looking, I mean, think about all the terrorist groups. They are the most gender polarized, extremely gender polarized. Now think about peaceful, more democratic groups. They are the least gender polarized. And it drives me crazy that when we don't use that as a measure of foreign policy or just common sense in our daily lives in terms of figuring out you know, what, what groups are and making that a part of all of our judgment. Somehow, I mean, you can't have democracy without feminism, I'm sorry. <laughs> And, and, you, and you, you, you can't have democracy with racism. You can't. Okay. So we, we just need to get, the, to get that straight in our heads, and then we'll know what we're going for. So, you know, interesting about gender and gender roles, in something I've learned quietly in prison is the women, many women replicate the roles that they had on the outside, on the inside, which has me thinking how much of it is innate, how much is socialized so that if they're used to a dominant male, they'll be around a dominant female, or you know, family structures are, are built. Yeah. Do you want to describe that? Because I think it's really interesting. They kind of recreate families, right? right? Well, yeah. In fact, uh, I don't know how it was decades ago, but even staff in prisons have started acknowledging that we build families as women, and therefore, appropriately so, they are allowed to have those families. So an older woman will be a grandmother or consider that. She'll have her children, which might be a 40-year-old woman, and really a couple generations of families built in a prison. For some of the women, it's the best family they've had, but for some, it's also abusive. And it had me thinking that maybe that, in some ways, is sort of an innate thing that they are seeking, well, what they knew or what they thought was family starting when they, when they were little. So I have an interest, that's more of a statement, but I have one of my daughters came home at three years old and said, 
Have you ever noticed that when the boys ask us to get off the swings, all the girls jump off and go slide? But when we ask the boys to get off the swing, they just look at us like we're crazy. And she was three. She was hardly could tell me the story. And I thought, so raised by me as a role model, and she was noticing it, but I thought, where is that coming from, that the little girls are jumping off and giving up their space? Mm-hmm. To, and I thought, at that time, I thought, maybe it's just sort of instinctual in us. But it has to be socialized, don't you think? That they'd yeah, witness. no, no, I think it is, it is socialized, I agree. I mean, it's not, it's not instinctive. But it, does, it is way earlier than we think. I mean, there, there's, you know, the kind of famous experiment in which little kids are asked, um, you know, little boys are asked, what, what do you want to be when you grow up when they're five, say, five, I think five to eight or something like that. And they say, you know, I don't know, pilots and five, whatever. And then the question is, well, if you were a little girl, what would you like to be? And they're just wiped out by this idea. And they like, say, you know, they say something? things like nothing or something. <laughs> right. And, and then they ask little girls, what would you like to be? Well, you know, I want to be a, a, a nurse, a doctor, or so, you know, more things now than they would have said in the past. Um, and, but they're still limited compared to what the boys say. And then what would you want to be if you're a little boy? And they said, oh, well then. So they're, they're not depressed by that idea, they're excited by that idea. You know, oh, well then I could be a pilot, a, I don't know, you know, all these other things. So, you know, that's how early, and there are all kinds of studies of the fact that we um, pick up little girls when they cry as infants, and we don't pick up little boys because we, they, we think they're supposed to be toughened even. I, it's so ridiculous, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, I don't know, put the babies in yellow blankets, not pink and blue, no, nobody will know, you know. <laughs> it's right. Uh, but it, it, you know, it does start very early and it goes deep, but it is reversible. It is reversible. And anybody here who had a loving, nurturing father is, is you know, who raised you as much, or any male who raised you as much is, is way ahead of the game. And well, what about us single mothers then? <laughs> yeah, well, no, but you can find, it doesn't have to be a father, that's right. why I say any male. male. Yeah, right. Right, so if you're a single mother, make sure you have good guys as babysitters. Right. We did that actually, right? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> I, I think a lot about, every time I think of prison, I can only think about what the root causes are, which sexism, racism, and, and, and poverty, and economic stability. Are, are you thinking when you think about the women's movement and now the women in prison that attacking the root causes will change it from the inside or it, a method of just blowing it up from the inside and working exclusively besides government but working with where the impact is well uh, it's by any means necessary you right, know yeah you just to have to and... you have to do it all you have to uh, I don't mean each of us has to do it all. I just mean each of us has to do whatever we can. You shouldn't feel overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, don't worry about what you should do. Just do whatever you can. And that may be making contact across the prison walls. I mean, Ms. Magazine for years, I'm not saying this is the answer to everything, but at least we have a prison program when, so that issues of the magazine go into women's prisons and shelters because frequently there's nothing to read there except the Bible, if even that's there, <laughs> right? right. Um, and Ms. Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer, no, but anyway. <laughs> they, <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's just one example, but we, we, we probably each have s- something that we can do. Uh, some we can visit, we can teach, we can write letters, uh, we can educate each other, we can go into schools where the prison pipeline is, you know. Uh, I, you know, we can talk about it when we're turn ourselves into an organizing meeting, which is going to happen any minute here. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, then I, I know that we will do that. And I was asked that yesterday, uh, what's the most common question that I'm asked? So 
we'll get to that. But I thought I was, I, last week I was invited to eight prisons in Kenya, which is really, and they all have children in there. And it had me thinking, because we're invited into 30 some states here, I am personally, and I, I wondered, I know that you travel other countries, did you feel or, or do you feel an obligation more to women and women's issues here than globally, or because my thought was, well, I should do finish my work here, and then I'll then I'll go to Kenya, and yeah, but you're never going to finish your work here, right? So. That's what I thought, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> no, I don't know. It just depends what opportunity. You don't have you know, alliance I, to one. I have opportunities to travel, so I just try to just do it. Yeah, right. to do it and to try to connect. I mean, the women's movements and all social justice movements have always been connected across national boundaries and have gotten ideas from each other. We, in this country, learned economic development from the women's movement in India. Who, you know, it, it, it just, you know, it depends. But it is true that we can learn from pr prisons in other countries that women can be with their children. And, yes. and I don't know, I was personally, you know more about the prison system. I've only seen in Minneapolis, uh, in Minnesota, that there is a, a, a place where at least some women can be in a kind of halfway house uh, serving out their sentences but be with their children. Right, and, well that's a movement because there's so many children now and, and mothers who are leaving their children behind. But it's interesting in, uh, and I think the cases in Zimbabwe, they bring the children in. So they build a community in there. But it's an interesting thing about Zimbabwe, which we don't do, they, uh, when the women are released, they're teaching them rabbit farming. So that they learn skills of, of small business, taking care of something. And we we don't have that exact same kind of reentry. So I'm interested in, uh, as you probably do, you when you travel abroad, you learn and, and yeah, you can you you get ideas from each other. There there are some. I mean, for instance, at Bedford Hills, there are women who train uh, seeing eye dogs and dogs who you know help the uh, disabled uh, train the puppies and train the you know and it, it it's it's really important you know because they have <laughs> a relationship with a living yeah, a creature, right, right, and they're doing something positive, it's really very helpful, right? Right. I was in uh, death row in Ohio, and the woman had a cat, in a, like a three by five cell, and she dropped down, I was looking through the food tray, and she dropped down, and she picked up this kitty and said, this is what gives me hope. And I thought that was amazing, it was just, it was a living, fuzzy thing. So it was, that was pretty moving for me. Did I get, did, is there a signal that we need to open it up? To, not need to, but want to. And I heard you say answers as much as questions, which is yes, a, not just that questions, I like. answers. Right. Uh, because the solutions you know, are here. This is an organizing meeting. Feel free to say anything. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you don't want it to go out of this room, just say so. Everybody here is frustrated. I don't know, uh, but. But just we just try to say it in poetry rather than a novel, okay? <laughs> um, I toured the uh, women's prison in Massachusetts. It's the only women's prison there. Framingham. Framingham, MCI Framingham. Right. And um, the head of the prison said that most of the women there were mentally ill or substance abusers. And so I think one of the causes has to be there's just not the inpatient treatment for people in this country for, who are mentally ill. They end up homeless, they end up in prison. It's definitely one of the factors that should be considered along with all the other reasons that you mentioned, but it's a big one. Right, I'm sorry I hadn't mentioned that actually because yeah. it's true in every prison I've been in, close to 90%. And diagnosable mental illness, things we treat out here like depression and bipolar, and I mean, like in the major, the major illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar, I mean, the, the inpatient treatment does not exist for them. I mean, there's right. very few beds, there's, um, they end up on the street or in prison. Right, and the staff feel that way too. They feel totally unprepared for, for what they all, every staff and person I've met in a prison says, we need training to right. deal with exactly. mental health. Right. Right, thank you for that reminder. Hi. Good afternoon, my name is Catherine. Uh, it's a privilege to have been a part of the conversation today with you. 
Um, I'm from the Osborne Association, and we are a criminal justice reform agency here in New York City. October, um, oh, Osborne started the New York Initiative for Children of Incarcerated Parents. And I wanted to announce this to the group today. Um, we're a collaboration of New York City organizations and individuals who recognize the experience of parental incarceration and meet regularly to talk about what we can do to support these children who are in New York and nationally. So we do have a website, New York Initiative, and October is See Us, Support Us Month. So there's an opportunity to take the pledge, and the pledge is simply, we care about you, we support you, and we will stay connected to see the many ways in which we can do this. So I wanted to share, I hope that's okay, in, in this forum. Um, I'll be here after what, what we do, just briefly. We have a class at the largest state women's prison in New York, which is Albion, that was mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah and, and we do also support keeping mothers and children and fathers and eight, women, and eight uh, male facilities in the Hudson Valley stay connected during the course of an incarceration. So there's many wonderful uh, agencies in New York, our children, children of promise, doing this work. They're part of the initiative as well. There are volunteer opportunities. Um, this is a community that really, um, there's many people in New York kind of standing up to support this population. So thanks for allowing me to uh, shout that out. And thank you for being. And are, are, there, are there specific kinds of volunteers or help that people in this audience might have? I mean, I know women who, or men who start help do groups of writing groups, say, you know, of the... Yes. I mean, because people here might want to volunteer in a specific way. Yes, um, I'm the director of Children, Youth, and Family Services for the Osborne Association, and we have a few opportunities under uh, the umbrella of our services. We also have a program called Family Focused Discharge at Queensboro, uh, which is a male facility in Long Island City, very close by. So um, I think of the details might be a little bit more than I can share right now, but I'll be here after if anyone would like to talk with me directly. And our sister organizations, Our Children Based in Long Island City, Children of Promise is here uh, in Brooklyn. I'm sure maybe some, of my, uh, some people might be here from those organizations. Um, I can give my card. I'd be happy to talk to people about that today. There are ways um, to interact with our kids. We have monthly recreational trips where moms coming home from prison and their children, we go bowling, we go to Coney Island, we go to museums, we go to this museum. Um, so we are here, there's organizations out there that love, care, and compassion adults to support moms, dads, kids, reunited. So Osborne Organization also primarily serves men and women um, coming home. The Children and Youth and Family Services is a division but overall, we have a lot of reentry services in the Bronx and all over New York City. Thank you for introducing okay. yourself. I yes, you can volunteer you. to this woman. Where yeah. are you sitting? <laughs> What's in the work? Where are you sitting? <laughs> I'm sitting up here. Okay, I'll you can volunteer. I'll in this area if anyone would like to talk after. I've heard about okay. your services, actually. When I was in Albia, maybe because of your services, they, women are often uh, traumatized, but in a positive way after I speak, because the, the women have lost their children think of my story. So Albion brought in support staff to be with the women and they broke into small groups after and I'd never seen that in a prison. It gave me an idea. Same as when we were there because then they go back to their cells and what? They're left with a story that's that's rent them apart. So thank you for the work you do. Glad to meet you here. It's nice that the museum is reminding us in the Infinite Blue exhibit that pink was considered the barrel color for boys. Uh, boys were in pink uh, in the 1800s, and so change is possible, and also what fools we mortals be. But um, I, I was at Bedford yesterday and I was reminded of the difference with uh, whoever is superintendent, because the climate in each prison and the programming changes depending on the superintendent. I was wondering if you experience that, Deborah, as you go from prison to prison, and also uh, if, uh, 
if you also sense a difference in the public-private, uh, if there's a difference there in, in programming or the feeling of the prison as you go, since you go to so many. Um, and, and also as a footnote, I, I was, I'm still, um, get choked up when I think about the women in my writing group who didn't have books, three of them didn't have a book in their hand until they went to kindergarten. There had been no books in the home. But we also learned yesterday that the mechanism for donations is changing. So that's just one thing to check. We, we got books in the prison, but, you, but even that changes. You have to, depends on who's making the rules. So my question really is about the, su the power of each superintendent and if there's anything we can do to address the best uh, practices for each person. Uh, thank you, Abigail. Abigail brought me into Bedford, actually. And it, uh, I know that the work you do is there pretty stellar. I've only been once. It, the reading part is major. And I didn't realize that, that sometimes that's the first thing. So related to uh, who's in power, everything changes depending on who's in power, whether it's prison or out here or, or anywhere. But what I notice is a shift in, uh, I'm having staff and administration say, we need help and we need the women served elsewhere than here, which is a change because it's jobs, right? It's, we're employing people by keeping them in prison. I was in a prison in California and the correction officer was giving me a tour, took me to an empty room, and he was lamenting that it was empty. And he said, a year ago, we were floor to ceiling bunk beds, but we've lost jobs. And that was the story he was telling me about the jobs. And I'm thinking, great, those women aren't in there, so. But I needed to stay and speak, so I didn't speak my mind on the inside there. But it's an interesting thing. Who is in power matters. But I'm noticing that we can change the thinking that I notice more staff and administration wanting to be allies with us in making change. Because they can be changed in mental health treatment, for example, and be of service in other ways. So I don't know if that answered your question, but there is a change, because I couldn't get back into Bedford after we were there. So, uh, that's, right, okay. And that was because of a change in somewhere in administration. actually the perfect segue because um, I completely agree with you that it's, it is about profit and that no change will happen unless we can make it profitable for people to want to choose a more therapeutic approach. And I have, I don't know if this is an answer or a question, I just love to get your thoughts on my kind of utopian dream of, of um, transforming, just doing away with punishment culture in prisons and transforming these spaces into places of um, creativity and music and dance and validation and therapy and animal therapy and, and essentially making it profitable for um, people who are hurt and hurting others and looking for validation and for their stories to be told and for visibility to making, turning prisons into centers where um, people are healed and won't, want, and won't have a need to go back into a prison type of environment. I don't know if that's clear. Yeah, I, do, I think we each individually and collectively have skills that we can transfer, whether it's computer programming or it's writing or uh, quilting or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, we, we can take those skills with us. And I, I have to say that everything you do turns out to have a result you didn't anticipate. You know, for instance, I was, you know, when I was talking about the Bayview Women's Prison, we got a message from women in London saying they were taking a women's prison there and turning it into a women's center. Who knew, you know? I mean, so you don't know what's going to happen. You just do whatever you can, and you will be surprised by the multiplication of it and the response to it. I am Nikki Luna. I am actually an artist from the Philippines. And I was sent here for an artist grant. Anyway, um, I just wanted to, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I like um, how you touched on intersectionality and how violence against women is something that we really should um, call out. And I also like how Deborah 
um, shared in your story about um, traveling to different prisons. Um, I, I'm an artist, a uh, visual artist from the Philippines I've sent here, and um, I also do a lot of work that I go to far flung provinces in the Philippines, and I also go to prisons um, to help. And in light of the current administration that we have back in the Philippines with our president, um, I've had received rape threats, not, um, not just to me, but to my two-year-old daughter. No, I just wanted to ask, uh, how else do you think, as feminist leaders, can you make it more inclusive? Like, to remember those in the developing countries, because you know what, honestly, we don't have a safe space for women. When you offend someone in our country, our senator who was um, fighting against our president was sent to jail. And a lot of the political prisoners who are my friends, they're still in jail. And a lot of, as long as you're, you know, if it's race here, it's class there. If you're poor, there's no way you're gonna get out of jail. So I'm one of those privileged who are able to travel, get out, um, still do my work. But honestly, I'm in tears because I'm going home next week. So, um, but, but I, I, I love the work that you do. And I was just really curious, this is no way of asking you how to save us, you know, but as feminists all together, we are all connected. And I was just curious, how else or in what ways do you think you can make it more inclusive of those in developing countries, not just the Philippines, but you know, a lot of the developing countries over there? Well, I, I think that uh, in general, you know, women's groups are connected in that way. I mean, and it's a two-way street. You know, we totally learn from each other. But, I, and it's, it's usually very organic, and it needs to be organic first because it's day-to-day. -day. But day before yesterday, I was at the UN where the European Union has been encouraged by the European women's lobby. You know, there's women representing all of the enormously disparate countries, you know, from East Europe to Bosnia to Britain, you know, I mean, you know, in, in Europe, uh, to take, I think it's $116 million of development money from the European Union and dedicate it to eradicating violence against women in developing countries on every continent, you know, not, you know, regardless of where, where it is, but any, any country uh, in which there's wide-scale violence against women. Now, you know, that's, that's up here, but it's going to sift down. We need to go to a prison in the Philippines. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would say, you know, whoever it is that uh, has any contact with the UN at all, you know, make application, have your applications ready, you know, because the challenge is to get that money on the ground where it really can make a difference. Well, we actually do that. Um, um, I'm part of another organization. But then, you know, I was just wondering, um, I guess, I guess um, it, I'm wishful thinking that um, uh, leaders like you could actually visit these countries and make it more like intimate, more reachable. I mean, because it's different when you're in front of leaders such as you. I mean, having this this space. That's yes. All. No. I mean, there is a lot of. I mean, I, I you know I go to, you know, because I mean, India is my second home, so I end up going to India or I end up going to African countries more. I haven't been to the Philippines, but um, no, absolutely. And there, uh, there's a group called Equality Now, which you may know, which takes up legal cases of women's equality in other countries. There's donor direct action. You can go online and discover on the ground projects that can be greatly helped by small sums of money. You can learn online exactly what those projects are. Uh, and if there's one in the Philippines that should be there, you should let, and isn't there, you should let Donor Direct Action know. So we're also trying to use the web to make these, obviously, to make these kinds of connections too.
name is Joyce. I'm here from Essex County, Massachusetts. Um, one little quick story, I'm here visiting my niece who moved here and is making her way. And last night we were talking about who would give you the most pause if you met a celebrity. And I was like, I don't, I don't think anybody. And now I realize it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. Like, this just happens to see us that we're, you know, we happen to be here. Um, anyhow, so I'm on this advisory board of the Women's Fund of Essex County. We raise money um, to give to nonprofits who focus specifically on women and girls, economic development, empowerment, safety, um, and education. And one of the things we were talking earlier, you um, were talking about the intersection of racism and sexism. And North of Boston tends to be really white for the most part, and the folks who have the, the most problems, the women we're trying to help, tend to be women of color. Um, so I was just hoping you could talk a little bit more about um, the, this intersection so that I can take some of that back if I want to steal what you, your, your brains on that so I can bring it back so we can help raise more funds for these people and I can say it to my peers um, in a way that's meaningful and impactful that moves them to help. I would just say listen. You know, there's no, nothing not rocket science, you know what I mean? The people who have the problem are way more likely to know the solution <laughs> than some expert out there, you know? Uh, so, you know, listen, and uh, don't think you have to be successful all the time. In fact, if you, if you aren't unsuccessful about a third of the time, you haven't taken enough risks. But, you know, but just, uh, you know, try to fund the people on the ground who are actually doing it, uh, rather than, I mean, there are exceptions, perhaps medical treatment and other things, but I mean, in general, I would say, to listen to the people who are actually doing the work and what do they need. Right, because we really can't serve people unless we know why and who we're serving and what we're serving. And I was just, you know, also how that, but how that relates to everyone else, how raising, raising up these women and girls is actually raising the economic empowerment of everybody in the region, uh, regardless of, of uh, color. So it's, it's, that's sometimes a challenge to get some people who, you know, have, you know, not necessarily have everything, but they're like, well, why are you just helping out them? Um, what about... What are they asking you? They, they're asking more like, you know, well, that, that was a, the women in Lawrence or the women in Lowell or the women in Lynn, um, you know, who happen to be women of color. You know, what are we doing here at home? Well, like, well, yeah, there's people in Beverly, there are people in Salem and, you know, all the different communities who are also helping as well. Um, they just kind of don't see it if it doesn't look like them. They don't feel like... Uh, uh, there's racism. There's that racism and sexism thing. So that's why I'm trying to help get them past that to understand between the two. Oh, well, think how boring it would be to be in a country where people were like, I mean, I... Are these your know, funders that are asking that? Uh, so it, it's, they're trying to expand between, you know, this used to honestly be a group of, you know, women that um, were very, very privileged and said we need to do something. They're very smart women who wanted to help, but now they're trying to expand. Um, to women who of, of all economic status. All right, here's, okay, uh, here's, I have an answer. I have, I, have I have a peculiar. <laughs> Those women who think they're privileged should remember that 51% of white married women voted for Trump. Not unmarried women. White men. I was wondering. So some of those, so some of those women are who think they're privileged are actually occupied in their souls and heads by, you know, because they're dependent on somebody else's income and social identity, and they're not voting for themselves. And so, ninety-five percent of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> so, so I would seriously question the idea of privilege. And the, 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 you know, the, 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 the best explanation I can think of is why 51% of white married women voted for Trump is what the great Harriet Tubman said, you know, the, who freed thousands of slaves by going courageously into the South and, you know, by dark of night and bringing out thousands. 
And whenever she was uh, complimented on freeing thousands of slaves, she always said, I could have freed thousands more if only they knew they were slaves. That's why 51% of white married yeah. women are right. So I, I just think we, you know, we have to look at real life and figure out privilege, privilege. You know, I mean, I don't know that that's so. You know, <laughs> to be occupied. Is, exactly. Why? Well, right. I would think they'd just be glad that someone's being served. But one thought that I'm wondering: you could go to the women who are being served and say, "We have this other community." Asking why we're only serving you, what should we tell them? So is it mostly women of color? So you'll get the answer. I think I know what it is. But ask them what they would tell if someone came to them and said, why not us? So be out of curiosity just to see what they say. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Barbara Glixina. I'm a public health nurse and a health reporter. And I want to challenge what we all maybe thought was normal about women and DNA, and that's why DNA is not used to exonerate women. And an action that I'd like to recommend is that we all reach out to the Innocence Project, which is the organization that is helping exonerate majority of men. I am not a forensic specialist, but I think it's bullshit that it's because women's hands are in many scenes where they're involved. And I think we've gen there's so much lack of information about women in science in terms of medicine. Men are mostly studied. And I think it's another area that we should not accept as being the final answer. Okay. Although I want to add to that that if most of the crimes for women in death row are committed in their homes or home of family, then their DNA would be imprinted around there as opposed to a man on death row who maybe the crime was committed elsewhere. So I don't know if, if I'm misunderstanding. So if it's in their home or their uncle's home or their stepdad's home, their DNA will, is there more. And so then it's hard to say you only showed up here once for the crime. Right, no, I don't take it personally, but... I just feel like the level of what we're capable of doing, what we have not yet discovered we're capable of doing, makes me feel like that answer I agree. needs to be explored. I agree. I agree. Because right now, right now, it's only, it's free men and not women. And as far as I know, the Innocence Project has a very large amount segment of women lawyers working for that. <coughs> And it is, I, the number that I came with that I didn't use is that 30% of exonerated women have had false or misleading evidence and two-thirds wrongfully committed and the only solution we have is DNA and it's not enough. So, it, right? It's not enough. So thank you for that. It, it, it would be going to the innocence prod because they're, right now that's what's used. And they're committed to this issue, but we have to see how committed they are looking at it. Right. Well, that's why I wanted to bring it up, because I think if we speak to it, then it could be addressed, maybe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily, and I'm a grad student at Brandeis. And this term, I am a teaching assistant for a black feminism class. And so in addition to reading a lot of amazing texts, our professor is having the students engage in this project where they have to write a letter of support to women and girls of color, it could be cis or trans, anywhere in the country. And so I just wanted to know what your advice would be, both of you, uh, for how they, these students could engage in this project respectfully and appropriately intersectional, just how 
words of advice for questions that they could ask, things they could say, how to approach this kind of project? Well, it's, it's kind of uncovering reality, you know, because actually women of color in general, but especially black women, have been way more likely to support uh, issues of equality, feminist issues, the women's movement, than white women have, just statistically speaking. So, I mean, my education came from Ms. Magazine because we published, and I think 73 or so, the first national poll on women's, of women's opinions on women's issues and on the women's movement. And it, it, it was a Lewis Harris poll, it was a big, you know, respectable poll. Uh, and it turned out that um, about 53%, no, I mean it was 30 some percent of uh, white women supported feminist issues of equality and the women's movement, and more than 60% of black women. So ever, you know, it's always been more women of color than white women, and yet the public perception is the other way around. So I think just recognizing reality and the, the, the people who have been, I mean, there are two things really. They're, they're the, the um, invisible figures of the women's movement, you know, who are not as visible as the white women. And then there, there are also um, the women who have been civil, very visible civil rights heroes, uh, like Fannie Lou Hamer. Every, people know her as somebody who was a hero of the voter registration civil rights era, but they don't know that she was a founder of the reproductive freedom movement because she came forward and talked about having been sterilized without her knowledge or permission in a, in a hospital. When, and the, the guys in SNCC were embarrassed by that, so she you know, talked about it with women and founded the National Women's Political Caucus. She was a founder of the reproductive freedom movement, yet people only think of her as for her voting work. See what I mean? So I, I think just uncovering reality, finding the hidden figures of, you might say, of the, have you seen this movie? I thought it was a wonderful movie, right? <laughs> of, of the women's movement is, will be very satisfying. And, and it will give you more cause to make a button I once made, which I should make again, <laughs> which said, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Emma, uh, I'm 19 and I just started uh, film school a month ago, and I'm hoping to use that uh, as a platform to um, start discussions, but uh, what I've noticed, uh, I mean, we were talking about privilege before, uh, but I come from uh, an almost all-white town, uh, and coming here, mm -hmm. um, just like seeing the gentrification and um, the privilege that people do have uh, around me. Um, and I guess um, my question is, uh, in what ways, um, just like specifically, I feel so frustrated when I feel like there's a lot of conversation and I don't know what action I can take um, and I like converse myself on the issues, but I never know um, just like what I can specifically be doing and I feel dormant uh, when I just know all of this information and I'm not organizing or, um, I don't know, and you've always been such an inspiration to me. I'm just, uh, what would you recommend? <laughs> You know, sometimes it's not always a glamorous thing. When I learned that the average reading level is fourth grade for men and women across the country, a commitment to literacy would change everything. It's education that opens up our minds, our curiosity, our expansion in the world. 
So when I'm at, that is the question I'm asked the most, is what, I, what can I do in, in audiences? To volunteer and, and work with literacy in children will change everything because it's generational. Literacy is taught, but so is illiteracy. If a child doesn't see an adult read, then there's not an interest in reading. It's a small thing, it's, it doesn't feel activist, but to me it is because you're giving a kind of freedom to the next generation. And you, I, I don't know what your life is like every day, but just don't worry about what you should do and do everything you can. Talk to the person next to you who you don't know. You know, <laughs> um, you know it's, part of what's great about New York in general, all the boroughs, is that we actually, it's like a big village, right? We kind of talk to each other more than, than other places. So um, d just breach the boundaries. Say what you're thinking. If something seems unjust, you know, whether it's uh, that somebody on the corner has to have a pocket full of quarters because they can only communicate by a payphone still, even in this day and age, you know, say to that person, well, would you like to use my cell phone maybe, you know, so you, I don't know, anything, right? <laughs> yeah. Just whatever comes up, do it. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to say I sent uh, a photo to my parents of you, and I said, you'll never guess where I am, and my father said it was on his bucket list to see you in person, and it's also always been on mine, so thank you for all the inspiration. You're that way given. far from your bucket, don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, my name's Anna. Um, I volunteer with Book Through Bars based in Brooklyn, and we send books to incarcerated men and women throughout the country, and we get lots of really touching letters from people who are trying to improve their lives. So I wanted to share that people can come and donate their books to us, and they can also come and volunteer and help read the letters and respond, um, sending books out to people. Um, and I also have a question, which is, that it strikes me that in the US, the penal system is very much based around the idea of punishment and retribution, so that prison is somewhere where you go and you should suffer when you're there. And it seems that it contrasts with some models, say, in Scandinavia, where prison is based on reform and re rehabilitation, and the idea is to have people in prison for as short a time as possible, mm -hmm. and almost everybody except the most dangerous people are going to be released, and therefore it's not about suffering when you're in prison, it's about how you um, can reform and change and, and become a better person in society. So I was wondering how you think we can change attitudes um, in the US towards prison, because it strikes me that we need a big attitudinal change to how prison is envisaged. Well, it, it is. I mean, it's our attitudes, but there are some people. Have you, have you seen Michael Moore's uh, Where Shall We Invade Next? Okay, that's a great example, right, of him going around to different countries in the world who have better ideas of, <laughs> than we do, and one of them is about prisons. Uh, and, you know, showing that there is a, a different way of, of looking at this. So, you know, it depends where we are. You know, your teacher's in the classroom. You can teach about, you know, so some of the things we've talked about today. Uh, you know, you, you go into the prisons yourself. You can send books into prison. You can... Uh, make sure that you give priority to employing pris people who have been in prison. What a concept. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, we, we can each do it in a different way. Do you have suggestions of ways that you've found helpful? Well, it, it, it just strikes me that it, it, then it just needs to be a kind of mind shift in away from seeing prison as a solution to crime. Um, and it, as, a, as one of the earlier uh, people who asked a question said, prisons could be a place which are actually about learning and healing um, and rehabilitation and not a place where you go to suffer. No. So the whole idea that, like, I think it's, it's there in, in, in media and, you know, in, in movies and so on, the idea of prison is somewhere where you go and you are going to suffer, and that's the whole point. And I think if we could turn that around and see instead that you know, there's a problem and a person has committed an antisocial act or ha has a 
as a problem in their life, then we're trying to solve that problem rather than just try to make it worse by, by locking them up for years on end. Right. Yeah. Well, that's why we don't have a, a criminal problem. We have a public safety problem. The issues you're talking about, healing and recovery and mental health treatment or public safety. And that concept of looking at countries where it works, we were talking about Norway on the, on the way over. I've seen that some of their prisons appear to be almost like cabins and they have phones and they're, they're built mm. by the water. So they are places of healing and, and family reunion at times and short sentences, and I don't even think they're called sentences. So looking at other countries where there's a model that works would really teach us. Mm. And, and there are some things, I was just thinking, well, <laughs> there's some things that people have said to me that they have learned in prison that I realize, you know, that we need outside of prison. For instance, of the men I get letters from who understand sexual assault, it is men in prison who have been sexually assaulted themselves. In the absence of women, they've been used as women. So they write to me and they say, okay, I get it now. I understand that sexual assault, body invasion, is a different level of trauma and humiliation and so on to be consistently, to have your body invaded, even from being beaten up. All right, those, those guys are great teachers of other guys about what sexual assault really is, who will be credible in a way that even, you know, that women are not or anyway will extend the credibility. Right. Although it's harder for men to speak up about that kind right. of because their masculinity feels right. threatened. But. And, and, uh, and, and the other thing is that sometimes women have written to me or said to me, that uh, in prison was the first time in their lives they ever felt safe. That's right. awful. Yeah. Absolutely. I hear that all the time. Right. Where they feel safe and fed and have a, con a regular place to sleep where they can actually sleep mm -hmm. and not sleep with one eye open. Mm -hmm. Are we having a signal for? Yeah. A few more questions. One more question. One or two. Thank Aren't you. We on that side? Yeah. Hi, I promise I'll be quick. First thing, this has been amazing. Um, my name is Mary Dove. I'm a community organizer in New York, and I actually do an education program. I have like 4,600 women in my group. And so what I wanted to offer is, because they're young professional women that um, are entrepreneurs and run their own businesses, or they're women in leadership. And I also recently did a project for women in the trades that I'm partnering on, and 3% of women work in the trades, which I think would be awesome for women in prison. So if anybody wants to speak to me about re-entry or if I can help anybody by getting speakers or any resources in our group, I would love to make them available. And also email me through the Unprison Project so I can have your contact info. Okay, great. Thank you so much. It's been just yes, The only woman I've ever met in my life who was making equal pay with a man was a plumber. That's and because friend. she was in a union and she was making a lot of money, you know, she was making like $100,000 a year as a plumber, and her daughter was going to become an electrician, right? Yeah, at that, and I just met her, that's Judeline Cassidy, so, um, yeah. I think one more, right? One more question. Well, I just wanted to add to the woman that was talking about mental health in prisons. I work for Family Connections, it's a program in Rockland County, New York, that su um, supports incarcerated mothers. Um, what I notice is that every woman in my group is, has drug addiction issues. Um, their, their mothers, their parents had drug addiction issues and it's going on generation after generation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they all speak about the guilt and they cry over losing their children. And I think the bleakness of it when they get out of prison is just, and, and the system being so hard to navigate and then they just use drugs again. And, um, so anyway, I just wanted to talk about that and how helpless I feel in helping them with that issue too. So. Well, we know that recovery from drug and alcohol addiction is a solution to a lot of things. So treatment in many forms mm -hmm. can serve that. And not always, it's not always high-end treatment, but mm -hmm. support groups, things like that. And we're all in some form of recovery. <laughs> <laughs> recovery from submission. Recovery from not voting, 
recovery from, you know, I don't know, name your part, right, right, right. Right. Thank you so much for Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Why don't you just, if you would just sit down just, just for a minute, um, there were a couple of things I wanted to say. As a result of this being the fourth year of States of Denial, uh, we do video every, um, every uh, program, and they are online and available. And uh, you, if you go on to the EASCFA, Elizabeth A. Sackler Center, for Feminist Art website on the Brooklyn Museum, you'll be able to pull up all of the programs that we've done since uh, 2014. And I think many of the areas that were discussed today, we have had panel discussions that have, in, many, in some instances, been in depth. So I think that it will be a very helpful uh, resource for you as well. The other thing I wanted to say is that I was, I'm listening to all of this. I'm thinking of people talking recently about the new normal and um, Trump and the new normal. And we're now in a place of, of post facts and all of that. One of the pieces of this that um, hit very hard home was when we honored Angela Davis here. Uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, she was talking about um, the absolute essentialness, first of all, of not electing Trump. It was pre-Trump, uh, it was pre-election. But also about abolitionist, uh, abolish, prison abolition. And it was listening to her that I began to understand the difference between prison reform and the, the necessity, from her point of view, of abolition, of the abolition of pr prisons. We have been talking here today as though all of the incarceration that we experience is normal, that this is the way you handle uh, people who, are, who have committed crimes, that this is the way people who have committed crimes should be uh, put away, that this is, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, one can go on and on. This is not normal. This is not normal. It has become this in this country. One of the reasons I think the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander was so important is because she was pointing out that it began uh, the penal system in order to create a new slavery. And of course, the Rockefeller drug laws and the reason that women are incarcerated. This, this goes very much to the heart of a white supremacist culture where we are looking to create a no class. And so I think we really need to, to sort of turn it on its ear a little bit and say, yes, we need to help the people who are there now but somehow or another, we have to really get our heads straight about what a civilized country, what a society wants to do to um, address issues of not only criminalization, but certainly mental health. One of the reasons that we have so many people who really need to be in hospitals is because of the shutdown. Of, me of mental institutions in this country, and it's been a disaster. So I actually took a moment so I could do my little editorial, and I apologize, but boy, uh, this is, a mark your calendars. We have two more programs, which will be in the Sackler Center on the fourth floor in the forum. One on October 29th, close Rikers. And November 19th, Becoming Ms. Burton by Susan Burton and Carrie Lynn. And it has a foreword by Michelle Alexander and it was published by the, um, by the New Press. And uh, it's another, a, a story of a woman who uh, is uh, post-incarceration and the journey that she went through in order to um, find her life and her center and, um, and live again. Thank you all for being here, and thank you very much, Gloria and Deborah.